at the Mutant Booth 2015 Body Power Expo. Big Ron Parlow here with Mutant Live. We're back with another episode. We got Neil Hill. I don't even know what to call you. Master guru, bodybuilding legend. Short guy. Short guy? Yeah, yeah, short yeah, guy. yeah. He is the Yoda of bodybuilding. Yeah, you know, he didn't just give that nickname to himself, or did you? No, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not something I would call myself. I'm who, sure. is, who is the first person to call you Yoda? I don't know. Um, I've been called many things, um, <laughs> but I think that um, it was a gimmick name that somebody decided to keep, and um, I didn't exactly go along with it, but I didn't have an option, so it is what it is. Well, then it's a real nickname. If you had nothing yeah. to do with it, you couldn't get rid of it. No, I couldn't, I don't think. There no, you I'm go. trying, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've, been, you've had a great year. I yeah. mean, everyone knows you as a trainer of champions, and you know, you help Flax, and you know, all the guys that you work with. So, uh, you know, you were telling me earlier, you know, with William Bonack and the guys that you've got on your roster, and you've added some big names, you know, I mean, what's this next year going to look like for Neil Hill? Um, I think first and foremost, it's about, it's not about actually what's going on in my life, because my real life ultimately reflects my time going in for my athletes. Uh, last year, we had the, probably the most successful year with my athletes as a whole. New signing with Steve Cook, and Steve Cook really brought a new package and new dimension to his physique. At the Olympia, I think the, uh, the uh, overall package that we brought was positive. Um, a new signing with William Bonac. I signed William the late part of 2014. Um, I worked with William probably in 2012, just a little, for about three months. And then we officially started working with each other in November 2014, sorry, 2013. Yep. Then we competed on, on stage together our first show, which was the Australian Pro last year. He came in a very, very close second, pushing uh, Sean Roden um, to a hard second place stroke, first place for Sean. Um, and the year for William, you know, sort of finished really high with winning their uh, first Russian Grand Prix. And, um, and he won Sacramento. And he won Sacramento. Which, uh, which we were actually him. at Sacramento. We saw that show. Yeah, so William had a really, really great uh, breakthrough year for him. And I think that uh, we brought a great package to the Olympia last year as well. Um, it wasn't the result that we were looking for, but it was great exposure for him. It was great uh, experiences for him being on stage at the Olymp Mr. Olympia, which ultimately is every bodybuilder's dream. I, I, I was trying to describe, I, had, I was talking to someone who wasn't familiar with William yet. And they're like, which guy is that? And I said, he's, his physique's a cross between Dexter and Kai. Right. Is that an accurate description? Because yeah. there is a lot yeah. of similar things. With the, you took them, put them together on a shorter, short frame. It's overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's funny how you say that because I think that William's got a beautiful aesthetic physique, but at the same time, he's got these muscle bellies and this mass of a Kai Green. I always said that he looks like a Sean Ray and a Kai Green. But if you look at Sean and you look at, um, and you look at Dexter, they've both, both got beautiful lines. They used to come in shape. So the thing about William, he's a very, very strong individual as far as being competing against because you can't really out-muscle him and you can't really out -static him because he has a blend yep. of everything. Yep. And he's definitely one of those new breed of athletes which is um, progressing and moving forward. I think the industry really like him. And I think that's really positive. He's got, you know, he's got the right attitude, the right personality. He's got a warm, you know, grace about him. He's very respectful, but at the same time, he's a hard-working individual who's driven by his goals to be the best that he can be for his family. So he's not just doing it for him. Right, right. He's doing it for his family, and that's. I think that is a dangerous combination. And the reason why I say that is because he's he's wanting to deliver something not just for him, but his loved ones back at home. So and he's got great. the golden smile. Yeah, he's got that he's smile. Hard to yeah. Miss, eh? yeah, he's got that golden <laughs> smile. He's got those teeth, and uh, they're probably worth about a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's a very impressive athlete. I remember the first time I saw photos of him, I was just like, "Geez, like, yeah. where did this guy come from?" And he's from the Netherlands, right? He lives in the Netherlands, but he's originally from Ghana. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Williams are originally from Ghana, but he uh, lives in the Netherlands, in Holland. Um, uh, Amsterdam and he has done for quite some time. He yep. lives there with his girlfriend and his, his, uh, his uh, little boy and his mum and his sister. So uh, that's where his family are now resident. And they've been there, as I said, for some time. And, you know, 2014 was an amazing year. We had five back-to-back -back wins with Flex Lewis. Yes. Um, I don't know if that's been achieved before in the past. Um, and it was something that we worked really, really hard for as a team. And we're very, very fortunate we've got a great team behind us as well. Now, I want to just talk about flex for a second because 
you literally met him when he was a, a junior, like a teenager. Wasn't he still a junior competitor? Yeah, like was, 19 years old? Yeah, he was 19 years of age. It was his very first show. So you um, could say you discovered him? I don't know if I discovered him, but <laughs> I definitely saw something in him. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember um, when I was a competitive athlete, growing up in Wales and growing up through uh, developing from a, a, a junior bodybuilder into an intermediate bodybuilder to a Mr. Bodybuilder, which is obviously the weight there classes. There we go, who's that pretty looking guy up there, eh? Uh, once upon a time. Hey, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a very flat, depleted look at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, juniors, it was like, the standard was tough. And I hadn't seen the standard really high for such a long time. And it was always disappointing because it was like, who's going to be the new breeds? Who's going to be the new athletes who are going to be able to represent Wales? And we're very, very passionate in Wales. It's a very small, you know, small um, country. And yeah. uh, there's very few of us. But we've always managed to produce really good athletes. And um, I was told about these two juniors which were going to be competing in this show. And one was a gentleman called uh, Jordan Jones. And Jordan was a great, great, great athlete. And the other one, obviously, was uh, Flex. He was a new athlete and he walked on stage and straight away it was like this kid has got the magic he has something i've never seen and i've been in the industry at that point probably for about 12 years right and straight away it was like he was just his lines he had these legs of a mr athlete he had this upper body of a junior yeah but he had this charisma and he had this presence and he had this confidence but at the same time he had this ability to engage people into him and I remember having goose pimples. I was uh, judging at the time. Uh, I won my IFBB Pro card basically 12 months before. And we basically briefly spoke after pre-judging and that was it, that was history. We started working with each other you know, from there onwards and that's literally 12, 13 years ago. So how old is this footage here? You and, um, you and Flex pumping out some, uh, some arm footage for Flex Online. That was, uh, okay, I think that was last, going into last year's Olympia. Right, that was okay. probably about... Um, He's got his signature <laughs> Flex Extraordinary yeah, that shirt on, so... Probably about two weeks out from the Olympia last okay, year. Okay, okay. And he was probably weighing in about 218 there. Right. He was actually stage ready at 218. Well, those freaky pictures that came out, remember those ones you oh, released? Yeah, the, they weren't quite clear, but he just yeah. looked ridiculous. You were standing behind him, and those got out all over the internet, and everyone was like, oh, Jesus. Yeah, I think... They looked like he weighed 250. And that, i tell you what happened there, Ron, is that um, that was... the. Um, last year that was actually probably the very end of december no that was actually the very beginning of january last year 2014. Right. we were in a, what i would say a really negative state as far as contest prep was concerned because uh 12 to 14 weeks out from the arnold he was weighing in at 208 pounds 208 pounds and it was a real concern because um we really needed to be about 220 225 at that point we didn't know if we were definitely going to be doing the show. Um, there were a lot of changes taking place, obviously, with him because obviously, you know, he was looking maybe to, uh, you know, join forces with a new company. He'd bought a new house. He'd been competing time and time again. He needed time off the stage. So after his victory uh, the year before in the Mr. Olympia, he literally didn't train from September right up until Christmas. And he didn't really eat. He just enjoyed being a normal person. Yeah. So actually, that those pictures were taken two weeks, exactly two weeks after, and he was actually weighing in about 220, 222 there, whereas only two weeks before he was actually 208 pounds. Just boom. And the reason why he blew up so much is because he had been in such a catabolic state for such a long time because obviously he had been leading that lifestyle and training and living and breathing bodybuilding. As soon as you put nutrients into the body and as soon as you already put him into the gym, and we obviously obviously force fed him with a lot of bad calories as well to try and get some volume taking place. He just ballooned up. So uh, when those pictures, you know, hit the industry or hit basically the socials, I mean, the, the interest and obviously the engagement was massive. It was like seeing those Dorian Yates pictures for the very first and time. We talked about those yesterday with Dorian, the yeah. black and whites. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a shocking photos yeah. of Flex. I don't know when I'd seen that before. No, and I think, you know, going back to Dorian, is that I think that those pictures of Dorian are probably the most, or, or like the pictures which st stay in my mind more than any athlete that I can remember up to yeah. this date, to be honest with you. Yeah, they weren't even stage shots. No, they wasn't, <laughs> no. So um, I want to talk about Steve Kluko because I'm excited about the fact that you're working with him. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've always thought that Steve was such an awesome bodybuilder, but I always thought he was not quite there on stage. Like it wasn't popping and, you know, coming out 3D. Yeah. You know, so what what is your plan with Steve coming this year, you okay. know? Okay, um, this year, I don't, my mic's not working. Oh, um, no, you're good. Okay, this year, 
we're going to be doing the Olympia. We're going to be doing looking at doing a late show. I want to get to know uh, what you know really what ticks with Steve's physique, and it's not going to happen in six months. I definitely, definitely see Steve being what I would say a work in progress. And what I mean by that is there's areas of his physique I feel that we need to bring up and he wants to bring up to be a top, top tier athlete. And that's right. going to be something which is going to be 18 months, 24 months away. But primarily this year I want to learn his body and I want us to step on stage with a physique which basically warrants what I feel that Steve Cookler was all about. He's got an amazing shape and structure. His V is perfect. Got a great he's frame. got that height, he's got that like organic ability to he's, draw attention. He's got no missing body parts. No, he hasn't, no. You know? you know, it's his back and his depth that I really want to bring up, but more importantly, bring him on stage dry, hard, and full. Whereas in the past, I felt that he's either been flat or he's been a little too soft. Yeah. So obviously, it's a combination of trying to find, you know, that even balance. And maybe we'll hit it straight away. Maybe it's going to take a little time. But I'm excited about Steve because I see big, big things. I think the yeah. industry knows that there's big things in there. Yeah. And I think that we just right, have got to find that right synergy. I think that we've started in a really good place. I think that we've bonded really well. I think we've really sort of built a really good foundation of athlete and coach where he trusts me and I trust him. And we trained together last night for the very first time. So okay. me and Steve uh, and Ryan Hughes trained together. We chest together. We had a great workout. And I'll train again later on with him. So I'm trying to spend as much time as I can with Steve. We'll and really I think that's going to make him. a difference. Yeah. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk to you about the way people prep for contests. And one thing that, you know, is sort of, you know, you hear like general talk and people chatting away and they, they say that they see regional differences, like geographical differences in how people get ready for shows. Um, you know, people say stuff like, oh, those Middle Eastern guys get really peeled or the Europeans get more ripped than, than the North American guys do nowadays or, you know, what have you, that sort of stuff. Now, you work with athletes from all these regions. Mm -hmm. so. Do you see anything fundamentally different about the way different, you know, groups of people are preparing for shows at, you know, the grassroots national level coming up to the pros? I think that, um, I think it's just hard work, you know, I think... The I people from the, like, almost harder places to live in have the harder work ethic? I think, to be honest with you, when you're, when you're born into a life of luxury, and let's be honest, we're all born into a life of luxury compared to going back years and years ago, yeah. then it's easier to take the simple roads. But it's also easy to put yourself into a, self, uh, a false paramesis of pushing too hard and pushing too hard. So I think it comes down to back to basics, really. You know, ultimately, what is going to see results? Hard work, ethic, discipline, and not trying to listen to too much conflicting advice as well. Because if you're listening to so many different protocols, Right. your mind is going to be full with different protocols. You don't know what's going to work, what's not going to work. I think the work ethic in the UK and Europe is really, really high. It was, it was really high. Right. Um, and I'm very much one of those people who is old school. Don't get me wrong, I think, I like, I think that I've changed and, uh, and I've progressed with evolution. And I think it's really important and we need to look around and look at the, the whole industry as a whole. It's changed. Yeah. Some, some ways for the better, some ways maybe not for the better. Um, but I think ultimately it's basics, hard work, and um, self-belief, but also a lot of these Middle Eastern people, they have very little that they can relate to. So for them, they're so passionate and it's such a big, 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 big dream. And it's hard, and they also realize that if they get to a certain status, they're representing the whole of their yes. culture, you yeah. know, their lifestyles, their religion. Whereas us, we probably look at it as like we're individuals and we're representing ourselves. Now, I'm here with Team BSN and I'm so proud to be here. Like, the same as you're here with Mutant. I'm representing Team BSN through and through while I'm here. Um, but at the same time, I know that I'm driven for my own goals for me. Whereas, at the same time, when you're a part of a community and they are part of a community and there's very few, I think there's a lot of pressure on them right. to be, you know, to, to really do well. Um, because that's going to elevate, you know, a lot of positive things in their life. That's what I feel. Right, right. So now, what do you see as things that are lacking? Like you said, the industry has changed so much. And I mean, I talk about that all the time. I mean, I make references to the 90s when we used to have to wait for the mags yep. to get, you know, the latest information. And now we're just kind of drowning in, in internet information from all these different coaches and, and gurus and stuff. 
what do you think would be the, the best advice that you would give a guy, you know, a good young bodybuilder who was going to really wanted to make a run at it? You know, what would you, what would you tell him? Just keep it basic, keep it simple? Yeah, I mean, definitely keep it basic and keep it simple. I loved the bodybuilding era of, um, I'd say, you know, the 90s. Yeah. I love the Sean Rays, the Dexter Jacksons, and Jax is still there, don't forget. The Kevin yeah, Dexter just still there, you, you know. know. Um, you know, Dorian's and, um, you know, Ronnie's. I mean, those guys were, what I would say, really conditioned. Like, yes. really conditioned. They, they wasn't so big, but well, they what, brought that detail and you, they brought that you, kind of look. Do you think they were just, they just understood that it was going to hurt? The diet was gonna hurt. Yeah, I think that they obviously, you know, you knew that you had to go to some dark places to get that condition. It's not gonna be easy, yeah. for instance. Um, but I think that, you know, mass is not always better, for instance. Seeing a bigger physique all, doesn't always equate to a better look. However, I'm a huge fan of uh, Phil Heath, and not because he's Mr. Olympia. I mean, being Mr. Olympia, he carries a lot of pressure on his shoulders. Yeah. He's, in, he's basically, he has all of us that he's representing. Yeah. But ultimately, he's representing his old brand. He's representing We The Publications. But I like his look because I think he brings a clean, crisp look. He's got a freakish look. It's genetic, but he brings a level of conditioning. But I think that when you step back and look at maybe other athletes, the condition isn't always there and they're trying to play the mass game. And to me, I, I just like the, you know, the real condition no weak m muscle groups, nothing which is being forced or enhanced where it's not supposed to be. Right. And I really like that look. Um, I think the industry has grown, as I said, really positively in, in some areas. Um, and the only where I say it maybe isn't so positive is that it seems like 90% of the industry at the moment, all they want to do is take selfies. You know, right. it's like <laughs> selfie, selfie, selfie. It's like it's become unhealthy because they are in love with themselves and instead of being in love with the industry. Does that right. make sense? I, I, I had a great term from an old coach of mine. He said that there were two types of bodybuilders. There were guys who loved bodybuilding and guys who loved themselves in bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. And that's always stuck with me because I always, it, it always pops in my mind when I, when I see, you know, meet new guys and meet new bodybuilders coming up. And I see a lot of that with the younger generation. They, that whole, like, it's almost in fashion now. Yep. Like, we remember the days where you were like an outcast if you were a bodybuilder. Yep. Like, you were the odd guy, like, you know what I mean? Yep. And now it's almost like everyone every, everyone wants to be in fashion. They want to be part of this, like, cultural explosion of fitness. Yep. But it's all about themselves, uh -huh. yep. right? Yep. And uh, so that's one of the things that I've seen change with, you know, the technology and how we all communicate now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree with you. I, I always talk about how I used to go watch an amateur show and the guys in 10th were still ripped. Yep. They were just in 10th because they weren't big enough or they didn't have legs yet. Mm -hmm. But now it's like you can almost just judge it on who's lean. Yeah. Because there's only a handful of guys at every you know, lower level show that are really ripped. Yeah. So, you know, it, I, I, I just think, you know, and tell me if you agree, but a lot of people just, they think, you know, they read about cheat meals and 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 no cardio preps, and and they think that they that this will work for them, but mm -hmm. it only works for a handful of individuals. Is that yeah. not true? Yeah, I would say for a lot of people, and um, I think the real positive thing about the industry is that it's become it's opened up the doorways to become more acceptable and more mainstream. I really like bikini, all right, and I really like men's physique, and the reason why I say that is because. Pretty much every woman would like to look like a bikini girl, and every guy would like a, a beach body physique. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great look. And yeah. It's a, and it's, a, it's an attainable look. Yes. But I think what's happened is that if you're not within those parameters, then I think what it's doing, it's um, it's it's causing a lot of um, insecurities in people. If that makes sense to you. All yes. right. I think that um, you know bodybuilding is the the core of who we are and what our industry is. But um, at the same time you know, expanding into positive areas, which I think that they, the industry has, I think it's been really positive. You know, the sport is, or the, the industry as a whole is really expanded. Um, but it's just finding that happy medium of what's, you know, what, what's really healthy and what isn't healthy. It's not down to anyone or anything in particular. It's just, it's just evolution, it's just changed. You know, it's really changed. I embrace it. I think it's great, I really do. Yeah, I, I agree too. I mean, I mean, I'm sure we hear you know what I mean. We hear a lot of the hardcore guys. I mean, everyone's cracked a joke about men's physique. 
It's, you know, everyone, ah, the men's bikini, they call it, that sort of thing. But our booth probably wouldn't be this big. Yep. And this expo wouldn't be this big. Yep. And the shows wouldn't all be selling out. And you know what I mean? Yep. This industry wouldn't be growing if it wasn't for this massive interest in it. And that's 100% positive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, all men's physique athletes, if they want to look great, they all train like bodybuilders. You know, some people, I'm, I'm a big advocate and I'll defend the men's, uh, men's physique division ultimately because ultimately those guys, the real guys, they train like bodybuilders. But yeah. They just genetically are not gifted that they can put all that mass on. But they're disciplined. You know, the difference being is they've just, they've just got a different look. And where do they buy their supplements? They buy the supplements from us guys, whether it's BSN, whether it's you, or yeah. whatever it is. They're, they're in our industry and, it, and I think that we should be embracing them, definitely. Yeah. But as I said, I just think it's unhealthy that you could walk into a gym and like 80% of the people are stripped off looking in the mirror between their sets. Yeah. You know, and having their abs out all the time because I think what it does it makes people outside of our sport feel very insecure and, and not engaging. What it, the positive right. thing it is, it's allowed the sport to grow and engage other people with like-minded goals, for instance. So as I said, it's, there's pluses and minuses, but I think that it's all good. Sometimes I feel like uh, the oddball out in the gym because I'm the only guy with a sweatshirt on. Okay, yeah. You know what I mean? Nowadays, yep. so like be fully covered up. And people even ask me, like, are you getting ready for a show? Like, yeah, and they're like, well, look if you're all covered up. I'm like, well, that's just how I get ready for a show. Well, my yeah. answer would be, it's because it's cold in Wales. <laughs> it's because it's cold in Wales, yeah, in well, Canada. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, w one of the things about you is your reputation. And your reputation isn't just the guys you work with, the long list of guys you've had, you know, do very well or win shows or earn pro cards, but also the companies that you associate yourself with. You know, you've been associated with some of the top companies in the industry that have good reputations, and you and I are both members of the Gasp Better Bodies family. Mm -hmm. So how did you get in with Gasp? How did that all happen? Um, I was introduced to Michael um, and Gasp through uh, Flex Lewis and also um, Chris Gethin um, a number of years ago. Yep. And um, I obviously heard about the brand. It was a newish brand, or maybe it had been out for a while, but it hadn't really hit the headlines. And it was a hardcore brand, and of course, I love my bodybuilding, and I'm a bodybuilder through and through, and I'm a, and I'm a, I'm, you know, I go back to a year where I'm just so passionate, and I still am. And when I saw the clothes, and I really liked it, yeah. and I, in, I got introduced to Michael, and we spoke, and it was like, I, I really like this guy, but more importantly, I like what you're doing. And we kept in touch with each other, and we build, built a, a relationship up with each other. And about two or three years ago, Michael uh, approached me and asked me if I would uh, be interested in becoming an official trainer to the brand and of course I jumped at it because there isn't a company in the industry within our industry which can compete against Better Bodies and Gas for what they stand for. There are a lot of other great uh, brands yep. which within that clothing market yeah. but it is at the top end of the tree and the same way is when you look at Weeder Publications and you look at Flex Magazine and Muscle and Fitness, Weeder it's been there from the very very beginning. Yep. Never went out of style. It never went out of style. And at 19 years of age, when I entered the industry, Joe Weeder, Weeder Publications, to be the Weeder athlete, you didn't have all these supplement companies around. So primarily, the number one athletes were always part of Weeder. Yeah. And being a part of Weeder, Team Weeder, and being a part of um, you know, what they stand for, and Flex Magazine, and Muscle and & Fitness, and uh, Robin Chang, and being a part of that, I feel very, very proud and I feel very privileged in the same way as I do feel towards GASP and the way I feel towards BSN. I signed with them with Flex last year, beginning of last year. We both signed up for three years and maybe we'd be there for another 10 years, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say, they're iconic names. They're, they've been in the industry for a long time. Why? Because they, they stand for something very positive. So I feel very lucky, I feel very humbled and I feel very, very fortunate that I'm in a position to be able to hopefully educate people and the masses from the opportunities that these great companies give me to bring me to these great events, etc. Yeah. Well, I got to do a workout with you at yeah. the destination. Yeah. And it was awesome because, you know, I, I control weights and I do three second negatives yeah. and, you know, I try to train very strict and the older I get, the safer I got to train. Yeah. You know, you can't do the silly shit you used to do when you thought it was, you know, going to be a smart move. Yeah. Um, so I always have, you know, pride of myself in that I move weights correctly, but you took it a step farther that day and you had me do five second negatives. Yeah. And from, you know, a three, four second negative to a five second negative was a, like a whole world of difference. It, 
I couldn't, I was having a really hard time estimating what weights to use. Yeah. You know, well, I can do, you know, with a two second negative, I can do this many pounds. So I'll cut that by 40%. No, should have cut it by 50%, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. That was a killer chest workout. You know, I think I used 120 pound dumbbells for one set. Yeah. And then we were plating a half on the bench. Yeah. <laughs> like it, but it was really good because it also reinforced that I was on the right track and I was training smart in a lot of ways and that my intensity was where it needed to be because, you know, that was, in some ways, that was a normal workout for me. Yeah. But in a few little things that you did, you totally changed it and made it a completely new experience. And then we did the biceps was a complete opposite. Yeah. We did yeah. that massive superset high, yeah. high rep stuff. Which, which, you know, I do high reps sometimes too, but you had those little things that you had me do that I'd never done before, like the ladder on the curls where we went up yep. and then back, back down. down. Yep. That was cool. You know, so uh, I, one thing I always tell the young guys is that you never stop learning. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people kind of close their mind off when they get to a certain point, oh, I know what I'm doing. But one of the exciting things that I get to do and one of the things about GASP is I get to, you know, another opportunity to learn even more off a guy like you who's trained all these guys you know so you know w when you train a guy like me where you never trained me before you know what's your goal you just want to try to show me something new or do you want to try to kill the guy I think or, for me it's about education it's yeah. all about education it's about bringing you through a new experience and trying to make sure that you engage on those new experiences and feel the differences that and are taking place at the take time. take them home. And then take them home. Yeah. Um, because if you don't take them home, you haven't learned anything. No. And a lot of people, they get brought into uh, their own self insecurities of trying to be as strong as they can and being egotistic and lifting as much weight as they can. And they don't really know what they're doing other than the fact they're just doing the same as what everybody else is. Right. Or what's going to make them feel better. But ultimately, that doesn't always equate to the better gains. So whether that's injury prevention, whether that's uh, performance enhancements, whether it's being becoming stronger, ultimately, if you apply the right training techniques at the right times, you are going to see a positive change. So everybody talks about the fact of um, progressive overload. Pro you know, for you to see positive change, progressive overload is important. Well, Y3T, when I designed Y3T, it was always, always designed around progressive overload. So whether we were concentrating on hypertrophy, muscle fibers, whether we're bringing in uh, mental stability, um, all these factors come into play. So when I designed the program, you know, I was very, very open-minded with trying to make sure we maximize so many different benefits from different protocols. And on paper, Y3T is a three-week training program, but it's actually not. On paper it is, because right. you need something to follow. Yeah. You need to be accountable. Right. But if you were one of my athletes, your Y3T workout that I designed to you could be very different between you and maybe Flex Lewis. So Flex Lewis, he might do one week one, two week twos, and one week three workout. Then one week one, two week twos, one week three. William Bach Bonick might be two week ones, one week two, one week three. Maybe myself might be uh, one week one, one week two, what two week threes, because that's builds the most amount of muscle mass on my frame, for instance. Right, right. So, but it takes a while for me to actually find out what responds to them. But on paper, as I said, it is a three-week training program. You will see results because ultimately, the body's built up or made up from different muscle fibers, different hypertrophies. And if you're only training one-dimensional, which you will be if you're always training one specific way, then you're not always going to be breaking down maximum muscle fibers in a certain protocol. So you are going to be potentially, and you will, not potentially, you will be slowing down your rate of development, regardless what your chosen sport or discipline is. Right, right. Now, what's your, what's your number one recommendation for somebody who's trying to bring up a weak body part? Where do you start? I think the very first thing I would brace, uh, look at is what area are they weaken. Um, the most important thing, I think, first of all, is muscle, uh, mind-muscle connection. So what I mean by that is I'm sitting here at the moment, I'm putting tension on my calf muscle. So my calf at the moment is contracted. And you can okay? feel it. And I can feel it, I'm tensing that muscle. Yeah. I can make a muscle group grow and respond without even putting weight on it. I can put about an inch, an inch and a quarter on my calves in three months by just tensing my calves every day, maybe for 30 reps. But I'm not putting weight on it because I've got a mind-muscle connection. So right. the very first thing is, is that I would basically get that athlete or that person, that client, to find that connection between that missing muscle group or that weak muscle group 
and make sure that they can actually apply it and put stress and load on the area first of all. And then take that into an actual exercise. It, it, exactly, and because continue. if I cross my hands here like this now, my, my chest, I'm getting pumped. Right, okay? I always tell people, you know, there, there's certain muscles on my body, I can almost just make them cramp yep. at will, uh -huh. just by flexing them really hard. Yep. And, and that's, if you can just try to practice that, like make that your, like a mental cue, yep. even if you never actually do make it cramp, yep. but you can improve your mind-muscle connection by just yep. trying to practice that feeling, mm -hmm. you know? So the first thing I would do is I would make sure that we basically get some, you know, basics where they are able to contract and feel a muscle. Then obviously, look at what area, what exercises work for them, what don't work for them as far as biomechanics are concerned because there are lots of great exercises but yeah. you might say, Neil, squats just don't work for me. And it doesn't matter how much we try to work on your technique, biomechanically, it might, it might not great. work for you. Yeah, it might look great and your form is perfect. Yeah. It might not mean that we need to put you on a different piece of equipment. And then what we would do is we would progressively increase the weight but making sure that we obviously keep that time under tension, preload going into play. You may, for instance, be 60% or 70% dominant of slow twitch muscle fibers in your arms, okay? Right. Well, why the hell are you doing primarily six to eight repetitions or 10 to 12 repetitions as your training protocol if those muscle fibers are not going to get stimulated from that protocol? Yeah. You know, and that's the beauty about Y3T is because we're always going to be stimulating maximum slow, medium, fast twitch muscle fibers in a given workout. I'm not one of those people who advocate training heavy in a workout and then doing a flushing workout at the end. Because your weakest link is always going to be your fast twitch muscle fibers. So even though you do high repetitions, you're not going to be able to maximize sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and you're not going to be able to maximize hitting your slow twitch muscle fibers because you're already pre, -exhaust, pre uh, uh, your, those muscle fibers beforehand have already been pre-exhausted. So they're always going to fail faster. Yeah. So I'm one of those people who emphasizes on one specific thing at a time before I go on to something else. Right, mix it up. Yeah. Workout to workout. Yeah. 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 No, I, I've seen some of your programs. I've done a workout with you. It was awesome. I'd love to do another one one we'll day. We'll do a leg workout together. Yeah, I'd love that. We'll get uh, you guys to film that shit. Yeah, no, I'd love that. Yeah, legs is something I love to train. Um, you know, I love to just try to take it to the wall, you know what I mean? And, and uh, I'm always up for learning. Cool. So I'd love to hit a leg workout with you. Maybe next time we're at destination, we can line one up. That sounds like a plan. Hey. Yeah. Now, how can people get a hold of you? Um, everybody can get a hold of me on uh, shooting me an email to neil at neilhill.co.uk. Um, also, I just want to touch on the base. There's a few things I'm going on with the industry at the moment or what I'm doing. Um, I've just launched my academy, which is basically a six-month online academy uh, where basically the students get modules every single month. It's actually run by myself and Paul Rimmer who's um, my doctor, he's been in university for the last 12 years, so he's basically a doctor in, in uh, biomechanics. Um, he's got a bachelor's degree in sports science, biomechanistry, right. and nutrition. Um, Paul's a very, very clever guy, so basically me, me and Paul are actually running that. And it's basically for those people who really look to increase their profiles, and also their skill sector and their knowledge. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, that's something I would really highly recommend. And also, I also give out free daily emails every single day. Every single day, I shoot out free emails. It doesn't cost you anything, guys. Okay. If you're looking to improve your performance, whether it's track and field, whether it's swimming, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's fat loss, whether it's transformation, pre-contest, every single day I give those uh, free emails out on nutrition, supplementation. Again, make sure you shoot me an email to neil at neilhill.co.uk uh, neil neil um, and then obviously you can sign up to my free daily emails, you get some really good content on there and you'll be able to find out what's taking place in my life and uh, the athletes that I work with and the couple supplement companies I'm working with on a daily basis. Thanks for coming on, Neil. Cool. Say hi to your son for me. Okay, sons. Uh, yeah. Sons, sons. Yeah, yeah, sons. I met the one at the Better Bodies okay, booth cool. that day, That's right? right? Remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah cool. no, th thanks for coming on. Neil Hill, trainer champions, the Yoda of bodybuilding, Y3T, BSN, Gas Better Bodies. And We The Publications. And so, We The uh, Publications. Thanks, yeah. guys. There cool. we go. Thanks, man. Big Ron from Mutant Live. I'm out. Cool.